What we found was that our device controls blood sugar in a broad range of people with type 1 diabetes, from preteens to teens to adults uh, who've had diabetes for you know, just a few years or for many, many years. Uh, people who were as young as six years old to as old as 76 years old, people who weighed 47 pounds to people who weighed almost 300 pounds. With the exact same device, the system is initialized only with the subject's weight. It doesn't need to know anything about their usual insulin therapy. Uh, it just comes online and begins to adapt to the insulin needs of that individual. It learns their insulin needs very quickly in the space of about a day. And then it converges and, and continues to learn as you change in, you know, through life and you have you know, changes in insulin requirement. As you go into adolescence, your insulin requirements tend to go up. Um, but what we found was that in this very broad range of, of people, the device controls blood sugar in a very tight range. Uh, HbA1c levels are predicted to be in the order of about 6.5%, plus or minus about a half a percent. The device achieves this by subs simultaneously with substantially reducing hypoglycemia. So in our adults, uh, in our adult subjects, in the last study, we, home, the uh, home trial we just finished, uh, at four clinical sites and 38 subjects, the average glucose level was 141 mg per deciliter, which would be an HbA1c of about 6.5%, with time below 60 mg per deciliter only 0.6% of the time. So we're substantially reducing uh, risk of hypoglycemia while at the same time giving our whole cohort average glycemic levels that would stave off long-term complications of type 1 diabetes indefinitely. What we saw was that it, as, ex as expected, gave much more insulin as was needed for the adolescent population. But the average glycemic control wasn't significantly different between any of these patients, which is quite remarkable. So the device was able to adapt upwards to those people who needed higher, had higher insulin demand and downwards to those who had more, who were more insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is yes, there were big differences in the way the system achieved the glycemic control, but in the actual outcome, there was really no significant difference between populations, which is exactly what you want to see. So essentially, what this does is it would replace the insulin pump, it would replace multiple daily injections, and it would essentially add a continuous glucose monitor if they're not already using one. So they would wear a sensor transmitter like I have here, and then instead of their, their insulin infusion set, they'd have one that would infuse both insulin and glucagon. And then that would be connected by a tube to the bionic pancreas. The, the wireless communication between the transmitter would still exist between the transmitter and the bionic pancreas, and then there would be these two tubes that would connect to your infusion set. Well, I would say everyone with type 1 diabetes would benefit from this technology. I think that is that statement is probably true. Um, I think that it will help just about everybody with, with type 1 diabetes. Now, as for type 2s, we haven't tested it in people with type 2. Um, we, we are very interested in, in doing that. At, at some point, we want to carry this into that population. And of course, it'll be relevant to those people with type 2 who actually are on insulin therapy. And we do think it could help many people with type 2 on insulin therapy. We don't, we don't have a, a, a look at that yet, but that's something we absolutely want to do.